Welcome to the We've Seen a Thing or Two podcast. As investigators and mediators focused on regulatory and workplace conflicts, we have seen a thing or two and learned a thing or two. In each episode, we will be speaking with industry leaders in regulation, human resources and law, as well as thought leaders and top performers in investigations and mediation. We bring our audience interesting and cutting edge information on conflict management as it relates to professional regulation and workplace disputes. This industry is one of many views and we have to say that some views shared by our guests are not necessarily shared by the We've Seen a Thing or Two podcast, its hosts or sponsors. Today's show is brought to you by Bernard and Associates, trusted investigation and mediation professionals since 2004. Now here's your host, Dean Bernard. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the We've Seen a Thing or Two podcast. Now, I want to thank you all for tuning in as usual, and I hope you're all ready for a great episode because we're very fortunate to have Richard Steinecke join us for some reflections on his illustrious career in regulatory law. Richard co-founded the law firm Steinecke McCure LeBlanc in 1997 and continued to practice professional regulation law until his retirement in 2022. Richard's known throughout the world as an authority in the area of professional regulation and, in fact, can be said to have written the book on regulatory law. And I mean that. He actually did write the book. It's called A Complete Guide to the Regulated Health Professions Act. This book has been really a go-to book, particularly in Ontario, for regulators and other lawyers who practice in this space. And because of its comprehensive nature, the courts, tribunals have cited the book dozens of times, uh, even in cases dealing with non-health-related professions. In 2015, Richard received the Regulatory Excellence Award from the Council on Licensure Enforcement and Regulation. And in 2019, he received the Tom Marshall Award of Excellence for the Public Sector from the Ontario Bar Association. The firm Richard collaborated in founding has become one of Ontario's most recognized firms in the area of professional regulation. Not only do they represent and provide general advice to regulators, but they take on issues concerning everything from registration, quality assurance, complaints, discipline, governance, and even illegal practice. On a personal note, I have to say that Richard's impact on the regulatory community in Ontario and elsewhere really has been massive. And I I like to refer to him as the the OG of regulation law. But Richard retired in 2022, much to a number of people's dismay. But he did retire in 2022. And the impact of his retirement, it's going to be felt by many. However, his firm continues to represent his legacy very well. And with that, it occurred to me that Richard would make a great guest to talk a little about the changes the evolution of professional regulation over his 25 years of practice, actually 40 years of practice, I think, if we count the time prior to Steinecke Mercure LeBlanc. So with all of that, Richard, welcome and thank you so much for being here. Oh, thanks for having me. You're just too kind, Dean. Thank you. <laughs> well, I have to say I've spent considerable time contemplating if I got you on the show, what I would ask you. And I suspect we could probably talk all day about various issues in regulation. But to keep it within our usual time frame, you'll be happy to know that I've limited the number of questions that I have for you, Richard. But I think I'll start by asking you, uh, well, eventually I'm going to ask you about retirement and how you're enjoying that, but that'll be a little bit later. First, I'd like to go to the beginning. I'd like to talk about where it all started and ask you, what led you to your decision to focus on the legal specialty of regulation law? Well, as many things in life, it was really a fluke. The firm I articled with and later joined had three areas of uh, practice. There was defamation, there was commercial litigation, and there was professional regulation. I really took the latter part and I was very curious about it. And I was reading all the cases I could find on it. While I was articling, I actually wrote a paper on unauthorized practice, which I submitted to the Schwartz Review that was looking at the health legislation in the 1980s. And I sort of showed up one day at their office and said, here's a paper. And they looked at me kind of strange, thanked (laughs) me. And and then they decided to actually fundamentally uh, alter the whole way in which unauthorized practice is handled in the health professions. So maybe I scared them off. I had a a mentor who I respected very much come up to me and say, Richard, don't restrict yourself too much to this one area. 
And I listened to a lot of what that mentor has said to me, but that part I didn't listen to. And as it turned out, I'm, I'm glad I didn't. Well, it certainly uh, turned out well for uh, all those you've helped over the years, that's for sure. What I'd like to do is I really want this to be more you talking than me. And so I'm sure over the course of the last number of years of practice, you've been involved in and seen a lot of change in professional regulation. So what would you say has been the biggest or the the most impactful change that you've seen? Well, I think uh, probably uh, philosophically, and that really ties in with everything else. I think professional regulation has transitioned away from a way to preserve the dignity and reputation of the profession to a regulatory tool to protect vulnerable clients and colleagues. And one example of this is dealing with sexual misconduct. When I started off, it was called sexual impropriety. And that term just focused on, you know, the registrant acting improperly. And so that term has been replaced with sexual abuse, which really focuses on the client or the patient and what's happened to them. And I think that sort of illustrates the point I'm talking about. If you want to look at advertising, you know, with the help of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, advertising rules for professions has changed from that kind of ad is unseemly for a member of our profession to a view that uh, advertising restrictions should be reduced so that there is the ability to provide necessary information to consumers. So I think that has happened, but, you know, I think it's transitioned even further today with how far can I go in promoting my personal brand without violating the rules? So sometimes things go a little awry. You look at intimate partner violence. That was something I think was not really considered at the beginning of my career. And now that's seen as an important part of professional regulation, that if a registrant engages in intimate partner violence, then people who approach them for services who have experienced that can't really trust that individual. And it's progressed in other ways, too. For example, there was one case a few years ago where private conduct like disrupting a school concert was seen as unprofessional or conduct unbecoming. And so and similarly, conduct or behavior towards one colleagues uh, has been seen as a, a barometer or an indicator that you may well be not the kind of person who will respect boundaries and protect vulnerable clients. This change, I think, is probably timely. I certainly was enamored with the old system, you know, the whole viewpoint that I'm part of a noble profession and I shouldn't embarrass that profession and I need to contribute to that profession. I mean, I certainly like that. But it's transitioned, I think, to something that's a little bit less noble. I'm a practitioner of a profession that will enable me to fulfill myself so long as I don't break the rules or exploit others. So maybe not quite as noble, but the old approach really was an old boys club. It excluded Mm. others. And even the whole concept of professionalism is a bit of a social construct. Talk about professional appearance or using professional language or even, you know, being punctual. Those are culturally laden concepts that can be used to exclude or discriminate against others. And I think we've also seen that the old system led to politicization of the profession. You know, elections to council were based on internal professional disagreements or even broader political differences. We're right now having an election of the council or benchers in my profession. And uh, one of the platforms being used for this is that we need to combat the air quotes woke ideology of the regulator. And that's, I think, getting away from the social contract. So we do need to, I think, move away from the old concept or our structure. And so if you look at that concept, it relates to things that we're doing for regulators in terms of the expansion of their mandate. If we are here to, as regulators, protect vulnerable patients or clients or colleagues, then, you know, sexual abuse, which I've talked about, mobility is important to allow practitioners to to move uh, to where they can be used. 
transparency by regulators becomes so much more important. And concepts like reconciliation with Indigenous peoples and equity, diversity, and inclusion become more of the mandate of the regulator than they would have been under the old system. This change in philosophy also relates to competency-based selection of council or board members, which we'll talk about a little later. And it also relates to the whole idea of consolidating or combining regulators. If a regulation is designed to protect vulnerable consumers, so to speak, then related professional activities can be regulated together. It doesn't have to be done by separate uh, regulators for each profession. The unique professional identity is no longer the key tool to accomplish this public protection. So the common theme in all of this is, I think, a transition for regulators to be protecting vulnerable recipients of unethical, incompetent, and even plain old insensitive behavior by registrants. Uh, sort of a very long answer, Dean, to your question. <laughs> no, it was, uh, it was great. And it's interesting because, you know, as you were talking, I was thinking of some thoughts in my mind, and in particular, one, this idea of consolidation, which I know is something that's happening in, in some parts of the country and is likely to happen in other parts. But I think back to many of the investigations that we've done as an organization for multiple regulators where three or four different professions are involved in the same circumstances of a particular issue and the challenges that sometimes were presented by those all being separate professions with separate ways of doing things. Even the regulators, although legislated under the same sort of piece of legislation, can all find different ways of doing things. And it sounds like we're really starting to to come together to realize that the purpose of regulation and the impact that it can have can be much greater with some of this change that's happening. So no, I think that was a great answer. Let me ask you this. Do you think that professional self-regulation has evolved as it should in terms of its accessibility and accountability to the public? I think it is progressing, but slowly. I think we're slowly moving away perhaps from self-regulation to public interest regulation in partnership with the profession. I am kind of excited about British Columbia's Health Professions and Occupation Act, which formalizes many of the developments that I just referred to. And it's similar to some recent reforms just announced in February in the United Kingdom for the health and social service professions. I do worry that the complexity of the BC statute might jeopardize the transition and it'd be awful if you know it failed or set a bad example that sets back regulatory reform. I think another area in which uh, regulation professions has evolved is moving towards competency-based selection as opposed to purely the election of professional members to the board or council. And that's been a bumpy ride. Competency-based selection is sometimes confused with government appointments, which in my view is worse than the profession electing their regulators. And so uh, I think if we move to that system, we're not progressing, we're going backwards. And the existing legislative framework is making it hard to move to competency-based selection. It's hindering the process unless the legislation gets amended like it has with the teachers in Ontario. You do have to be careful with competency-based selection that you're not perpetuating existing networks or existing philosophies amongst the board or council members. So I think for competency-based selection to work, it has to be something similar to what they have in the United Kingdom, where the regulators publish the companies that they need of their board or council or even their committee members. They don't passively wait for people to put themselves forward, but they actively recruit good candidates that they have an independent body that's assessing and screening the candidates, probably relying on expert consultants, you know, human resource professionals, and that the process has external scrutiny and validation. I think that is what needs to happen for this to work. And we've seen some, I think, what we might call baby steps happening with professions working within their existing framework. And I think it's already starting to show some promise. The other uh, thing that's been slow but happening is openness and transparency and using a consultative process when making policy decisions, etc. So we've now had for some professions for some years, open council or board meetings, open discipline hearings, and more consultation on policies or regulations or bylaws as they're passed. 
And we've also seen some progress in terms of expanding the public register, which we'll talk about, I think, in a minute or two. So the bottom line is, I think there is definitely progress, but it's slow. Right. Well, and it's interesting because with the answers you've given to these first two questions that we've talked about, it's been a sort of a, a perfect segue into my next question for you, because I'm curious, you know, you've played such a large role in regulatory law and you've been an influencer, frankly, on regulatory processes. And I wonder if you suddenly were facing 20 more years of continuing your work, what would be your focus? I mean, what do you think should be the focus for the next evolution of professional regulation? In many ways, I wish I could be involved for 20 more years. Uh, It is so exciting. I think, as mentioned, we need to get CompC-based selection right. If that works, wonderful. If it doesn't work, it's going to be a setback. I think also the public register, or as they say out west, the public registry is a lost opportunity. Regulators are posting increasingly more information on their registers but they're losing out to online reviews and ratings. From what I can see, online reviews and ratings can be inaccurate, they can be unfair, and they can even be subject to manipulation, both by the platform and by the individuals who are part of that. But the reality is that hardly anyone goes to the public register anymore for their information about registrants. So to remain or become even more relevant, I think regulators need to further expand the available information on the public register. And I'd like to see that happening the next 20 years. Uh, More complaints data, more information about the outcomes of any inspections or any participation in quality assurance activities. I think when uh, registrants participate in credible continuing professional development or postgraduate education, it's something that should be on the public register. And, you know, practice information such as hours and languages of practice uh, should be available. And I go one step further, and, and I always get pushed back on this, but I think that regulators should get into the ratings business, uh, monitored and structured reviews by clients. And so I think that this could be done. Uh, you could have the regulator know who the people are that are posting the information. You wouldn't tell the registrants necessarily, but at least the regulator would know who it is. And rather than just, you know, doing a survey of one to five or your thoughts, have them complete an actual survey with specified questions about different areas of service, you know, timeliness, communication, and how they communicate information and deal with concerns. And I think that that information should be appealable. If the registrant feels that it's unfair or they should have a chance to respond, the regulator could possibly change the posting if it wasn't fair. Of course, if you did this, you need to have a mechanism to address the discriminatory impact of these things. There's some research that shows that in universities, when you have ratings of instructors, that women instructors tend to get lower ratings, I guess, built in by the prejudices in our own society. And so I think you need to address that perhaps by such things as how you word the questions. Another thing that I think is going to be increasingly important in the next 20 years is compassionate regulation. A lot of work's been done about this around the world, including the UK. So when there's an investigation, that there be a prompt and personal notification of the registrant, not just a letter and not just a legally worded letter, but maybe asking, you know, can we have a phone call to discuss this? And then a plain language explanation of the process. And then having a single contact person with the regulator that you're dealing with all the time, that you're not being shuffled around, and possibly having a support person. The BC legislation has this concept in it for complainants. And the UK is talking about maybe having a pool of peers that you can call upon when you're dealing with an investigation or a complaint. Of course, having a prompt process is really a huge part of compassionate regulation. And then, you know, a plain language explanation of options that are open to you as the process goes along. I mean, compassionate regulation needs to apply to both the registrant and the complainant. A third thing, and this is really a long shot, but perhaps there is with recent events, especially in healthcare, an opening for national licensure. And we saw just this week as we're recording that Atlantic Canada has introduced a regional licensure model for 
physicians. So I think these are things that I think will be happening that others will be heavily involved in. Right. I can tell you, you've touched on three things that are in this that are quite near and dear to my heart. One of the things I think of, you know, when you were talking about the registers or registries, as you mentioned in the West, one of the things that I think about with that is public awareness. I really question sometimes just how much public awareness there is of the regulator. Do people know to go to these places? Do they realize that the regulator is a source of information about the individuals who might be providing them with their healthcare services or legal services or what have you? And so I, I've often thought that regulators could perhaps do a little bit more public awareness education. And unfortunately, I think sometimes that efforts to increase public awareness perhaps might be perceived by registrants as not perceived positively. So, I mean, that's just one of the things. And your final point or your second to final point about uh, compassionate regulation, I mean, it's really taking a trauma-informed approach to use a different phraseology for all of that. I couldn't agree with you more. I think that whether you're the person who's making a complaint or the person who's embroiled in a matter because somebody's complaining about you or what have you, I think that there are ways to do this that can humanize the process. So I really liked your comments about that. And my final point would just be on the national licensure. Uh, as an organization that has to be licensed, our, our company has to be licensed. I've been going through the administrative nightmare of obtaining licensure in multiple jurisdictions. And I've, I've often wondered, why can't this just simply be a national licensure, it would make life so much easier. Of course, I understand why. But anyway, just a few thoughts I had that all of the things you're saying, Richard, really strike home with me. So now I have a bit of a tougher question to ask, but I feel I have to ask you this. Do you have any regrets? As you look back on your career, maybe a, a project you couldn't get to or a decision you might have made differently, anything like that that you can talk to us about? Sure. You know, I can't understand when people say they have no regrets. My life, including my <laughs> professional life, is absolutely full of them. And I won't get into my boo-boos or my insensitive comments or actions, but I think I will say that I feel that I've been late to some significant changes. I do feel I was an early adopter of the sexual abuse reforms back in the late 80s and early 90s, but many of the other things, I was a late adopter, including COMC-based selection, which I resisted for years and years. Similar to that, I think being a little bit, well, maybe a lot late in recognizing my privilege for being a white, male, educated, now older professional. Fortunately, I've had some colleagues who've assisted me in that regard over the years. But, you know, even now, I'm only beginning to recognize how even progressive regulatory initiatives like the sexual abuse provisions can be exploited to victimize oppressed groups, including, right. in that case, women. So one of the things of the sexual abuse reforms was zero tolerance and a mandatory revocation. But in the course of my career, I've certainly seen that weaponized during the breakup of relationships where, you know, a, a male spouse would reveal that their relationship started while they're being treated and resulting sometimes in the revocation of the registration of their registered spouse. I don't know what the answer to that is, because when you do permit exceptions, they tend to be used by the privileged people. And so the exceptions uh, do seem to be misused. Uh, so I don't know what the answer to that is, but certainly it's a pause for thought. So I guess my thought on this is the greatest antidote to being late, recognizing things, is to try to be as humble as you can and open to the idea that some of our cherished beliefs that we've had for decades may be incomplete or in some cases even wrong. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. And and you made a number of points there that I would certainly agree with. And, and the weaponization of any kind of investigation process is something that we as investigators see quite frequently, not just in the area of sexual abuse, but in, in other areas as well. So, and your point about people who have no regrets, I don't know who those people are either, but if they have no regrets, they're either incredibly fortunate or perhaps a little blind to their own issues. But now I'm going to go to the flip side of that and ask you, what's one of your greatest accomplishments in your career? Maybe a moment or an event that you look back on fondly. Thank you. I think for me, I was fortunate to appreciate early on in my career that professional regulation could be seen as a standalone activity. When I started off, professional regulation was seen as a minor bit or part of civil litigation, when you're talking about discipline hearings, 
and administrative law. But as you know, I started writing the book on the Regulated Health Professions Act that I did, or beginning with a few brave colleagues to open what I believe to be the first boutique law firm in Ontario on professional regulation and participating in educational activities, including organizations like CNAR that focus just on professional regulation. That's become an immense source of pride for me that that was one of the few things I recognized early in my career. It, it certainly has served you well, and as I said before, served many regulators and others well. So congratulations on all of that. And Richard, I don't know how many of these episodes of the podcast you've listened to, but I always do like to ask my guests to tell us a little something about their interests outside of their busy professional lives. And now that you've retired, what's occupying your time? I'm, I'm sure you've got some interesting things on the go. Thank you. Uh, Certainly, I have young grandchildren and they consume a lot of time and I want to enjoy that as much as I can while they're still young. I've continued to be involved in volunteer activities that are quite fascinating for me, uh, especially, for example, being involved in a small community food bank. I'm still actively monitoring professional regulation cases and developments, and I'm pestering my colleagues <laughs> about them all the time. I'm pretty sure they're going to block my email pretty soon. <laughs> and exciting, just this week, the, for recording purposes, I published my first crime novel, Disgraceful, Dishonorable, and Unprofessional, on Amazon. It's about a lawyer practicing professional regulation to help solve a murder of a colleague. It has lots of professional regulation content to it. And I'm working on my second one called Conduct Unbecoming with the same lead character. So uh, yeah, I've been really busy and really enjoying it. Oh, that's amazing. And congratulations on all of that. And I guess I did see some posts on LinkedIn about your book, your crime novel, and I'm certainly planning to get that one. I'm looking forward to reading it, as I know many others are. I saw all the comments on LinkedIn about that. So yeah, congratulations on all of that. Actually, my wife and I just celebrated the arrival coming up one year ago now of, of our first grandchild. And there's such wonderful little additions to the family. So I can certainly understand your enjoyment around all of that. So with all of that, then, Richard, maybe I should just ask you how our listeners can connect with you if they're interested in reaching out. Well, first of all, I'm trying really hard not to get situations where I'm asked to give advice. But beyond that, I'm active on Twitter and, as you noted, LinkedIn. And I can be reached there by anyone who wants to share personal updates or updates on professional regulation or who want to give me feedback on the crime novel. I'm a little afraid of the feedback that you're going to give me when (laughs) you see the police investigation aspects, I'm sure, are pretty wild and off base. Uh, Hopefully it's made up by being fun. Oh, I'm sure it will be. But you can be rest assured if I see something in there that I can comment on, I'll I'll send you a message about that. (laughs) Great. Richard, again, thank you so much for joining us for the show. I really, really appreciate it. It's been just a pleasure having you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure as well. Well, I want to close the interview by saying that, you know, Richard really is a beloved contributor to the regulatory community. And and while I said earlier that your contributions, Richard, to regulation will be missed, I also know that you as a person are going to be missed. Your support, your kindness for those that you've helped along the way, it really is going to be remembered. And it's my honor to have you on the podcast, Richard, and I, I wish you all the very best for a happy, healthy, and I'm sure what will still be a very productive retirement. Thank you. All right. Well, enough of that gushy stuff. It's time to wrap this one up, folks. So thanks again for listening. As I say, we always want to hear from you, our audience. Tell us how we can do better. Tell us what we're doing right. Tell us what we're doing wrong. Your feedback really helps us to try and improve the way in which we're broadcasting these podcasts, the guests that we have, everything. So please give us your feedback. Just as a reminder, all our podcast episodes are posted on the Bernard & Associates YouTube channel. And of course, they're on all the uh, podcast directories. But if you missed any episodes, the YouTube channel is a great place to go and catch up on some of the old episodes and maybe check out some of the other great content we have on that YouTube channel as well. For me, you can reach me directly at dbenard at bernardinc.com or Dean Bernard on LinkedIn. And with that, thanks again, everybody. And we'll see you next time on the We've Seen a Thing or Two podcast. 